Hey everyone and welcome to another edition of Drone Life News. Joining me as always, the editor-in-chief, also nicknamed Smiley. We're talking about Miss Miriam <laughs> McNabb. Miriam, how are you doing? I am doing excellent as always. Paul, how are you? Doing great, doing great. Actually, I would say uh, very happy as there was a note that came in from one of the viewers uh, asking us to cover topics related to heavy lift drones. Is that right? Yes, absolutely. And, um, you know, shout out to Chris. Thank you so much for writing in. Thank you very much for watching the podcast. We really appreciate it. Great suggestion to talk about sort of where heavy lift drones are going and what that looks like as a sector of the drone industry. And it kind of launches into um, some good stories for this week. So let's start there. First of all, Let's talk about what a heavy lift drone or a workhorse drone means. So when we're talking drone delivery and we're talking residential drone delivery, we're still at kind of one pack of diapers. You know, <laughs> it can deliver small things. It can deliver your Starbucks coffee, but it isn't going to deliver anything heavy. When you're talking about a workhorse or a heavy lift drone, you're talking about things that can lift sort of uh, 30, 50, 60, 70, or more pounds. And the reason that that's really significant, there's kind of two things that sort of present themselves there. The first is that they can carry heavier payloads. So whether that's heavier and more sophisticated sensors, or whether that's heavier in terms of a delivery payload, that's heavier equipment, that's more stuff, that's whatever it is. That's one thing. But it also means that they can carry more fuel. And so there's another sort of significant element to the concept of workhorse drones or heavy lift drones in that they can fly farther. So when we're talking supply chain logistics, I think it's really, really significant. And I guess the other thing I would say about this uh, Paul, and then we'll, I want to hear what you think about how we're going to sort of train that next workforce, because I know a lot of people are actually looking for help right now. The other thing about sort of heavy lift drones is that I think we're going to see a lot of military commercial crossover here. So we have seen that with small drones, you know, particularly you think about Skydio developed with the DOD for short range reconnaissance. That's the Skydio X2D. And almost uh, most of that functionality was made available to the commercial sector with the Skydio X2E. And I think when we're talking workhorse and heavy lift drones, we are seeing a lot of development happening in the military. And we're going to see that crossover into the commercial sector, kind of for the benefit of logistics and supply chain. Yeah, no, I think that you're definitely right that the military um, and DOD operations will probably fuel uh, research and development of better heavy lift drones. Although, uh, you know, me and, uh, and Skydio, I'm not sure that that's the best example because the X2E has that uh, encrypted long distance uh, transmission protocol. And that is not, from what I understand, on the X2D as in Delta. But I only bring that up because, uh, you know, Skydio is not something I would ever consider heavy lift. You know, when I think of heavy lift, I think of people, again, like Watts Innovations and their new Prism Sky, you know? Absolutely. So I was really just talking about crossover. Oh, gotcha, so gotcha. So stuff that's developed for the military and comes into the commercial sector. So in the small drone space, Scotty was one of the companies that was able to do that. I think in the larger heavy lift drone space, we're also going to see this happen a lot. Oh, couldn't agree more. Yeah, t couldn't agree more. And, you know, you brought up another issue, which is a lot of manufacturers are, are learning the hard way that without robust training on these uh, larger vehicles that their success rate with customers 
uh, is fairly low. In fact, we have been using our props educational platform to help manufacturers build robust training programs. And it's funny that you bring up heavy lift drones today uh, because we have literally been working on a production for Lucid Drone Technologies, which is a company based out of North Carolina. And they are using drones to clean the outsides of buildings, you know, sanitize and clean outdoor spaces like stadiums, etc. And I would definitely consider that a heavy lift drone. Uh, it's larger than an M600 for all of you who are interested. And it's carrying uh, essentially a pressurized hose line to be able to spray. And I know for a lot of people that may not seem like heavy lift, but if you think of 200 feet of you know hose filled with pressurized water or chemicals or whatever, it is actually a pretty heavy payload. And it really does seem, Miriam, like the industry is moving to these bigger drones. Look at the Astro, look at the Air Peak from Sony. That's a pretty sizable drone. That's no Phantom, you know, that's larger than an Inspire. And so I think the industry really is moving to these bigger drones. Training is definitely an issue. We're trying to solve that for as many manufacturers as possible right now. But in addition, I think it's going to be these heavy lift drones that end up creating the true DeWalt of, of drones, you know, a drone that could carry, uh, you know, uh, robotic arms to pick things up, to trim trees, to clean, you know, to do a lot of the dirty, dangerous jobs. Think of even high rise window cleaning. I know that may not seem like a big deal and you're not even replacing jobs at that point either. You're empowering the window cleaners to just use a new tool to be more efficient and effective. And, until, and a whole heck of a lot safer. Oh, yeah. <laughs> just, just saying. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. 100%. And I think that particular issue resonates with the Lucid Drone Technologies founder, Andrew, as he's had personal experience in the, just how dangerous it is to be in the cleaning business and how powerful it is that, you know, drones can essentially solve that problem. So all in all, I think it's extremely powerful uh, to have a heavy lift drone, but we haven't seen a heavy lift drone that's systematized to offer all these different accessories to do more drone jobs. But I think that that future is uh, right along the horizon and coming to us at light speed. Yeah, I think that when we're talking about, you know, geospatial, you can put very sophisticated imaging sensors on smaller drones. But as you said, you know, where you're working with Lucid on uh, carrying pressurized water and a hose, um, think about how that applies to like firefighting. And you kind of need both, right? You, you need both. You need something to deliver equipment to somebody who's out in the field on demand and something that might weigh more than five pounds, you know, and you also need this, this kind of intelligence gathering, this aerial perspective that a lot of the small drone sensors offer. So Really interesting. Thanks again, Chris, for uh, writing in. I always love to hear from you guys. And uh, I definitely think heading for um, greater importance in the sector. Again, that's another sector that will, I think, flourish with BVLOS flight. Also, because they can carry that heavier uh, fuel load and go further distances, they'll be able to really meet potential when uh, BVLOS flight is regularized and easier to access. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. Um, in fact, that leads us right into our next story as one particular manufacturer out of France is carrying very heavy payloads, uh, doing jobs a lot like what we saw in early January of this year when the National Nuclear Security Agency was using helicopters to fly around DC to measure potential radiation or nuclear threats. But there's a new company here in France that is doing almost the same thing. Is that right, Miriam? Well, I think that um, Azure... 
Drones has a new drone out. It's the SkyTech Dizi. I'm not sure if that's dizzy or or what, but um, you know, dizzy. just launched and immediately won an award at uh, the World Nuclear Convention as a as a valuable tool. So this is equipped with very sophisticated radiation detection. If that's not a great job for an unmanned system, I don't know what is. They are able to work in nuclear facilities. They are installed at several nuclear facilities around the world already, kind of doing inspections uh, and things. This allows, of course, inspectors, um, drone pilots to stand in a safe zone without being exposed to radiation uh, and to perform necessary inspections. So development of those sensors and the drones to carry them fully automated is really a game changer in the nuclear energy sector. That's awesome. That uh, that definitely makes the world a safer place when nuclear is being hailed as the true clean energy. So very, very, very interesting. And I know that you have another news story uh, that's all about industrial platforms, kind of similar to Azure here. <laughs> Those two kind of go together. Percepto, uh, another really focused on automation, drone in a box solution designed to be on industrial sites far away from their operator. And they got approval in Australia to fly beyond visual line of sight at an industrial site. It's kind of a it's sort of a gateway waiver, if you will. It, it sort of opens the door for this fully automated industrial application. Wow. Wow. That's that's definitely, uh, definitely impressive. You know, what's really nice, Miriam, is that all over the world we're seeing drones do more kind of nuanced projects, projects that have that direct dollarized value for companies. Uh, in our next piece of news, there is a, a company out of San Diego who seems to be wanting to fill a security gap. Is that right? Yes. Yeah, so um, there was a lot of news in the counter drone or a s- airspace security sector this week. And it's not just this week. I've really seen this um, over the last year. Lots and lots of funding, lots of acquisitions, lots of, you know, partnerships happening. So SkySafe raised $30 million um, to expand. They're an airspace security firm. And I think that the when you talk about sort of counter drone and airspace security, the important thing to recognize is that basically you want to look at this as um, you, you've got somebody, a doorman, you've got a doorman and they're saying, hey, this is a private party. You can come in and you can't. Right. So and and if you think about it that way, it's not nobody is allowed in this airspace. It's we recognize that you guys belong here here because you're doing legitimate work at this event, at this stadium, at this um, sensitive site or whatever, and you guys don't belong here. You're just looking around, and so we want to keep you out. And that's a level of um, sort of sophistication that is really kind of necessary as the commercial drone industry scales. And that's what SkySafe is saying is, hey, we want to be there as part of the solution to scale the commercial drone industry by saying we recognize that there's a legitimate purpose for drones at airports. There's a legitimate purpose for drones and stadiums, but you need the tools to say you guys belong here and you guys don't. And they have sort of a different technology. You know, what they say in their press release, of course, it really leaped out at me is we could have solved this Gatwick Airport incident in minutes. Like there wouldn't have been this days and days of, of flight delays. We would have found those guys and um, shut it down. So. So really, really interesting. I was going to say really interesting uh, indeed. But is it correct that private companies could use something like SkySafe to monitor the airspace, but it's only federal law enforcement that could use SkySafe to mitigate a flight? Is that right? 
So, you know, I think there we're getting in out of sort of what the capabilities are and what the and into what the legalities are. So I think it depends where you are and what you're doing, right? So and who your customer is. I think an average, you know, private company probably uses something like that to say, hey, these are all my guys. Who's that? And maybe I need to either take a walk over there because they're on my property or call the police or do whatever I need to do, you know, which is totally appropriate. And and uh, yeah, seems like the competition, though, is growing as a famous uh, contractor for uh, state and local police. Is it Axon or Ax- Axon has also developed some sort of counter UAS technology as well. Is that right? Well, they partnered with um, existing counter UAS technology firm D-Drone. And this is another really interesting story just because Axon, we've seen kind of getting into the drone space a little bit. Now, Axon is heavily into the law enforcement space. So they are accustomed to selling into that public safety sector. They sell things like body cams for police officers, right? So um, tools for the public safety sector. And so in an interesting move, you know, Axon has partnered, I think it's with Skydio to do some distribution with them into law enforcement and public safety. And now they've partnered with D-Drone to do to provide sort of counter UAS technology into law enforcement and public safety. So that could uh, result with sort of you see, OK, we got a local agricultural fair or something like that that's going on. You know, uh, here in New Hampshire, we have the racetrack nearby, whatever it is that you happen to be doing. Local police are responsible for securing that area. They're used to that. They do, you know, um traffic mitigation and and all of that stuff that they're used to. And now maybe they need a tool to extend to that security uh, in three dimensions. Yeah, no, it's a really, really good point. And your point earlier regarding uh, drones, even at airports, go back to the Lucid drone technologies, you know, their drone has been asked to be used for plain de-icing. Just think about that. You know, I mean, there are so many uses for drones at airports. And I remember you were there. I'm, I'm pretty sure you were there because we hung out uh, at the, uh, what was it, the DJI conference? Yes. W, yes. And they were using drones yes. to inspect American Airlines planes. Yes. And that was absolutely amazing. That woman is a genius. That was um, sort of American Airlines had this sort of hackathon where they allowed, they asked employees to come together and come up with ideas. And, you know, such a valuable um, application. They're able to do the weather inspection. Like if a plane comes in after there's been a hailstorm or there's ice or something, the drone can come in and do the inspection to make sure that that envelope is uh, intact and okay without having to move the plane off of the runway into the hangar, put up the cherry pickers, you know, get the guys all over it, which is just hours and hours of that plane being out of service. So, um, yeah, lots of good applications. If you're talking heavy lift drones, you know, getting equipment out to planes on the tarmac or, or whatever it is. So, um, yeah, lots of applications for drones in all kinds of places. So the, the point is not to keep them out entirely. It's to differentiate which ones belong. Yeah, totally. Which is going to make airspace safer for everyone. So, Miriam, thank you so much for joining me as always. Do appreciate it. And I want to wish you and your family a Merry Christmas. Thank you. You too. Really looking forward to it. Yeah, me as well. Looking forward to a nice little vacation. I know a lot of people are as well. So enjoy that time with family, disconnect and go flying and enjoy taking flight in the beautiful, beautiful skies. That's going to do it for us today. Thanks again for watching another edition of Drone Life News.